Hey everyone, thank you for joining me for this week's Torah portion. We're in a completely new book. We're in Vayikra, or in English, we call that Leviticus. Um, I wish we could have done a CM for finishing Exodus, but we didn't. That's a little party when you finish a book in the Torah. We didn't, but hey, it's okay. We, we still party. <laughs> Inwardly. So, um, we're going to get started with Vayikra. The first Torah portion is literally called Vayikra from the book of Vayikra. So it's like saying the first five, the first uh, chapters, one to four, I believe, of um, of Leviticus is called Leviticus. <laughs> so I um, also just want to give a shout out to, um, I just got a book called Vayikra in Context, and uh, it's by Sina. Um, Kahen and then Rothstein and I'll be using uh, a few of their ideas of course we want to give the credit and not you know kind of say too much so that you get the book but if we could just present a few ideas here they're presenting some commentary from um, a leading scholar of Italian one of the leading scholars of Italian Jewry and I cannot say this gentleman's name is Hakim's name Rabbi Ben Mosek, he was born in 1823 and passed away in 1900, may his memory be for a blessing. So shout out to Sinai Kahan and Ben Rothstein. So I'll be bringing some things from that, but if not for this week, because I just got, literally got this book today. And um, by Ikran Context, a scientific and Kabbalistic commentary of Leviticus by Rabbi El 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 Elia uh, Ben Mosek, again, excuse me for his name, from Da'at Press. And, of course, you know, we'll be using our handy-dandy Hayenu um, Chabad.org. Okay, so let's get into it. Verse 1. Hashem called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meat and saying... So let's play a game where we figure out what's going on here. Because when we finished up in Exodus, Moshe had literally brought the tent up ready for service. Um, and the sages told us he it, for the consecration, and then the sages say he collapsed the tent, and then he brought it up for everyday use. So the, he raised the tent up, the tent of meeting up. Um, sorry, it's Jordan. Raised the tent of meeting up, uh, so he can consecrate everybody, everything. And then the second time he did it was so now the the tent. Um, I'm saying the tent, the Mishkan. Excuse me, I meant to say the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle could be used for everyday use. Okay, so now let's see where we are in all of this. All of this. So Hashem called to Moshe and spoke to him in front of the tent of me and saying, Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, When any of you presents an offering of cattle to Hashem, you shall choose your offering from the herd or from the flock. If your offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you shall make your offering a male without blemish. You shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting for acceptance on your behalf before Hashem. Jordan, stop. Okay, so we are a little bit familiar with the burnt offering that was used for the consecration of the tabernacle, um, the Ola offering. So... Now, it looks like we're going to get some instructions on types of offerings. So, um, this is when you're bringing uh, an offering of cattle to Hashem. So, let's see if we get... Um, I'm just trying to see if there's... Okay. So, you're going to bring an offering of cattle or beef or something like that. It should have no blemish. You're going to bring it to the tent of meeting for acceptance on your behalf so somebody's going to look it over most likely and you will lay a hand upon the head of the burnt offering and it's, isn't, isn't that interesting it's called a burnt offering before it's even offered so it's not burnt yet but that's what we're going to call them um which we have here ah, this was looking for so it as you can see the word there it's the ola offering the it goes up in smoke Okay, so you're going to lay a hand on the head of the burnt offering, that male cattle without a blemish, that it may be acceptable in your behalf 
in expiation for you. Let's just see what if the uh, sages have anything to say about that. Rashi, this, uh, okay, so he's going to point about, he's got a point about when you put your hand upon the head of the burnt offering. This is intended to include an obligatory burnt offering also in the law um, as well, which means laying on, hands on the head of the sacrifice, um, smicha, as well as to include a sheep that is offered as a free will burnt offering. Oh, they call that a smicha? It's, that's also what a um, rabbi gets when they're ordained, if I can say that, the smicha? Or is it simcha? I don't know. Somebody put it down there. Um, okay. So, okay. The bull shall be slaughtered before Hashem, verse 5, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall offer the blood, dashing the blood against all sides of the altar, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The burnt offering shall be flayed. I think that's when you cut it in half and cut up into sections. Uh, when you open it up and just lay it out like flat, the body. So, uh, verse 7, the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and lay out wood upon the fire. So this, see, you can see that this is no little grill. This is a big platform um, because a lot of these are happening. It's not just one or two. They're doing this for all of Israel. So this is not a little altar. Or not a little wall, grill altar. <laughs> um, Aaron's sons of priests shall lay out the sections with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. Its entrails and legs shall be washed with water and the priest shall turn the whole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to Hashem. Verse 10. If your offering for a burnt offering is from the flock of sheep or of goats, you shall make your offering a male without blemish. Oh, I forgot to even say. Um, uh, I hope I said thank you for studying with me. <laughs> But I wanted to tell you, because I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Um, I wanted to tell you that the uh, Vayikra means, and it means he called. And uh, because the opening verse says, Hashem called to Moses. So that's why it's called Vayikra. All right. Um, okay. Okay. So, verse 9, its entrails and legs shall be washed with water, and the priest shall turn the whole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to Hashem. Um, so you can see the job that the priest has to do to make sure that this offering does completely go up into smoke. Verse 10, if your offering for a burnt offering is from a flock of sheep or of goats, then you shall make your offering a male without blemish. So it sounds like you can still do an Ola offering um, with another type of animal. It just has to be an, a flock kind of an animal, a sheep or goat or something like that. Um, but it still needs to be a male without blemish. Uh, verse 11, it shall be slaughtered before Hashem on the north side of the altar. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall dash its blood against all sides of the altar. So again, you can see this is going to be a big... Um, altar that you can do all these things for several people at the same time verse 12 when it has been cut up into sections the priest shall lay them out with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar so once they cut the sections up they look they take the head and the suet let's see what suet is oops um oops i didn't mean to do that let's see what that is and they lay that on the wood uh-oh, nobody wants to say anything, huh? His Um, this okay, after it has been cut up, so he's focusing on that portion. This has been has to be stated explicitly in order that we do not think that only the large animals, that is bullocks, required to be cut up. No, mention is made of these animals being flayed, as it was taken for granted by the Torah that the reader understands as ah. So his cooney is just saying, you don't see that the, the flaying part the, that was first mentioned with the, the cattle. They don't have it here because the Torah is saying, uh, I think everybody knows you still have to do that. You're doing the same thing. It's just it's not a cattle type animal. It's a goat or a sheep. But he didn't say anything about the suet. 
<laughs> um, okay, so, so, but you're gonna take the head and whatever sue it is, and you're gonna put that on the wood that's on the fire that that is on the fire of the altar. So that doesn't get the well, that goes up in smoke, but it doesn't get like the grill <laughs> part, I guess. The entrails and the legs, right? Verse 13. The entrails and the legs shall be washed with water. And the priest shall offer up and turn the whole into smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to Hashem. So now we see the entrails. I think that's the innards, like the guts and stuff. And the legs shall be washed with water. And um, so you're going to wash that. And then you're going to put that on the altar. And the priest is going to turn it into smoke on the altar. As opposed to the other part where the, lead, the head and the suet went on the wood for the fire. So we can see all parts and the blood is getting dashed against the altar. So you can see all parts of the altar are little, literally being used in this uh, ceremony here. And look at that. That's the end of our first reading. Let's get into our second reading. Um, I know Rav Bernstein tells us that Another way to call Leviticus is Torah Kohanim. It, Torah being instructions, the instructions of the Kohanim, what they're supposed to do. So um, as you can see here, there's a lot of instructions going on because they do it wrong, it's invalid. So um, that's what this is. So let's continue. All right, so we're gonna we're in Leviticus chapter one verse fourteen. If your offering to Hashem is a burnt offering of birds, so now we see that you have an option of an Ola offering being um, birds. Um, so if your offering is of birds, you shall choose your offering from from turtle doves or pigeons. Now, okay, I'm. I'm a suburb person, but like suburb close to the city person. And we call pigeons flying rats. So this is really shocking to me to see a pigeon. A turtle dove sound like something nice, but a pigeon is like a flying rat. So I'm wondering if that's um, some typo or something. Uh, offering consists of bird birds would be mean from here means that in every part of the bird is fit to be offered up. But the bird in question is missing one of its limbs. Ah, you can't um have a you can't offer up a bird missing a wing or a leg. <laughs> missing a wing or a leg sounds like a chicken order. Um, let's see. No, nope, I don't really see anything about the pigeon. I uh, if you guys have something, please um put it in the comments below and help us out because the pigeon is throwing me off. Okay, so let's continue with these Ola offerings. Um. So if your offering to Hashem is a burnt offering of birds, you shall choose your offering from turtle doves or pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar, pinch off its head, and turn it into pinch. Turn it into smoke on the altar, and its blood shall be drained out against the side of the altar. Uh, yeah. So um, Melech, uh, Melech, and he will pinch off. The priest himself, that is with his own hands, at, on the top of the altar, he was not in use he was not to use me, excuse me, a tool such as a knife. This is in consonance with the commandment that in a building, the altar, no iron, no tool, sword, knife was to be used. As the altar is designed to prolong man's life, whereas the knife or sword is used to shorten man's life. So what makes sense when building an altar makes even better sense in the procedures to be performed on the altar. Just as the act of pinching mentioned in chapter 5 verse 8 was performed at the neck so here too, the Torah refers to the bird's neck being pinched off. The head is not to be completely severed, however. We're going to keep going. Okay. Verse um, 16. He shall remove its crop with its contents and cast it into the place of the ashes at the east side of the altar. So we know that's the front side of the altar. Um, the priest shall tear it open by its wings without severing it and turn it into smoke on the altar. Upon the wood that is on the fire, it is a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to Hashem. Baruch Hashem, he, he likes that. 
So we can see now why there's no knives and things up there. The sages just explained that to us. Why you see a lot of ripping and pure, just fighting with the, well, not fighting, but and instead of Hassan Chop, it ain't nothing like that going on. Um, okay, we're still in the second reading, but we are in chapter two now, verse one. When a person presents an offering of meal to Hashem, the offering shall be of choice flour. I think this word means meal. A um, mean ha. Um, yeah, I think that's what that is. A mean ha. I've heard it said a mean ha, but um, I, it to me it makes more sense when the he, the het is pronounced like different from the chaf or kaf. So I say the way I was taught um, mean ha. So the mean ha offering. Okay, so when a person presents an offering of meal, a mean ha offering to Hashem, the offering shall be of choice flour. The offerer shall pour oil upon it, lay frankincense on it. So we're in a new type of offering now. We finished with the ola, the burnt offering, and we saw only animals there from cattle to birds. That's the ola offering. It, can, it must be a burnt. But this one now in a mean hot offering, and we always are already see that uh, choice flour can be offered here. So let's see what else we can do here. Okay, so with this mean hot offering, it shall be of choice flour. The offerer shall pour oil upon it and lay frankincense on it. So you're taking the the choice oil uh, flour that you brought, pouring some frankincense. It's gonna smell amazing when you when it gets burnt up, or however that happens. So in verse two, and presented to Aaron's sons, the priest, the priest shall scoop out of it a handful of its choice flour and oil, and as well as all of its frankincense, and this token portion he shall turn into smoke on the altar as an offering by fire of pleasing odor to Hashem. Oh, wow. Okay, so he takes this gift and he the priest makes a nice concoction of oil and frankincense and the choice flour. And he still, he takes a bit of it, and he still takes it and makes it turn into smoke for a pleasing odor to Hashem. And the remainder of the meal offering shall be for Aaron and his sons a most holy portion from Hashem's offerings by fire. Ah, so we see that, so not all of the uh, meal offering gets the frankincense put in it, just a portion of it that's going to be up in smoke. The rest of it goes for Aaron and his sons to eat. So, whereas with the other part, with the Ola offering, all that, we didn't see Aaron's sons. If I'm wrong, please put it in the comments. But it looks like we didn't see Aaron's offerings getting a portion of that, did we? Um, we saw um, them making it go to smoke. But this one, they get a portion of it. Verse 4. When you present an offering of meal baked in the oven, so now this is already a cake, it shall be of choice flour, unleavened cakes with oil mixed in or leaven, un, excuse me, or unleavened wafers spread with oil. So you can also, also for this minha offering bring in cakes that you already baked. And it tells you how. Either they're going to be with oil mixed in or wafers instead of a cake. Uh, it probably is almost like a matzah, this wait, wafer spread with oil. Verse 5, if your offering is a meal offering on the on a griddle, it shall be of choice flour with oil mixed in unleavened. Oh, if your offering is a meal offering on the, okay. So now if you if your offering is going to be on the griddle, <laughs> it's going to be of choice flour and they're going to mix in the oil unleavened. Break it into into bits and pour oil on it. It is a meal offering. I'm just going to um see what the sages are saying here because I'm not sure if the person that's bringing it is doing that on the griddle or the, um, okay. So here it's, it's going to be talking about the part about if an oblation baking in the pan be thy offering. Okay. It, and that one said, I take upon myself the obligation to bring a meal offering baking in the pan. So the person at home is doing that. This was a vessel employed in the temple in which they baked this particular meal. Oh, excuse me. This, no, they did that in the temple. On the open fire and oil. The vessel was not deep but flat. Therefore, the meal offering made in it was hard. For just ah, so they brought the oil, uh, the meal, all um, 
choice meal, choice flour, and then you got the uh, priest in the back baking it up. Okay. Uh, all of them requires a threefold use of oil, pulling oil on them after they're prepared, mingling them with their dough and pressing oil. I also was saying there's three places, three, three times in its preparation where the oil is placed on it. Very interesting. Please make sure you guys check out these notes so you can understand what's going on here in this Torah, Torah Kohanim. All right, wow, that's the end of our second reading. Okay, let's get into that third reading. We're in Leviticus or Vaikra, chapter 2, verse 7, Perek 2, Pasuk 7. If your offering is a meal offering in the pan, it shall be made of choice flour in oil. When you present to Hashem a meal offering that is made in any of these ways, it shall be, be brought to the priest who shall take it up to the altar. Um, the priest, verse 9, shall remove the token portion from the mincha offering and turn it into smoke on the altar as an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to Hashem. And the remainder of the mincha offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, a most holy portion from Hashem's offerings by fire. So again, Aaron and his sons get a portion of that. Verse 11, no meal offering or minha offering that you offer to Hashem shall be made with leaven. For no leaven or honey may be turned into smoke as an offering by fire to Hashem. What do the sages tell us? Okay, ye shall not cause to ascend in fumes. Okay, any honey. So any sweet juice of fruit is called honey. Oh, that's interesting. Anybody got anything else? Uh, so see, all refers to leaven. It is the same case with honey. Some say that our verse speaks only of day honey. The same is true whenever scripture speaks of a land flowing with milk and honey. This is what appears to be proof of their opinion in the book of Ezra. Okay. In order to prevent prohibit the leavening of handful and burning on the altar this being included interesting okay please please look at all this good um reasoning that the hakamim the sages are giving us for why hashem said no leaven and no honey wow wow okay verse 12 you may bring them to Hashem as an offering of choice products, but they shall not be offered up on the altar for a pleasing odor. So you can bring leavened items and honeyed items, honeyed minha to Hashem. It's just that it's not going to be offered up for the pleasing odor. But it's still okay to bring things because you still bring, you know. And it's probably going to go to the priest. Let's just check and see what the hachamim say, the, the sages. Um... Uh, but what is it that you have to offer of leaven and honey? The offering of the first fruits, the two loaves. Okay, so the, the sage is saying here, what, well, what do we make that has leaven and honey in it? Ah, the first fruits, the two loaves of the Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks is um, Shavuot. Um, or Feast, yeah, Feast of Weeks. And so that's when you can bring these kind of things. All right, that's cool. Verse 13, <clears throat> you shall season your every offering. Yes, Hashem. Seasoning, okay? Seasoning. It's important for food. Okay, you shall season your every offering of meal. A minha. Let me just want to make sure it's a minha. Yep. Minhat. Minhat ha. You shall uh, season it with salt. You shall not omit from your meal offering the salt of your covenant with God. With all your offerings, you must offer salt. Now, does this, so this is for everything that we just learned about for the Minha? Okay, so this is because a covenant was established with the salt as far back as the six days of creation when the lower water, waters, that those of the oceans, received an assurance that they would be offered on the altar in the form of salt. Oh, that's fire. And also as water in the ceremony of the libation of water on the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow. Wow. The ocean said, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> that's fire. And that's, yeah, wow. Okay. 
Wowie. Okay. Um, for but if anybody knows, is it are is this for every minha that we are offering salt? It looks like it because it says you shall season your every offering of meal with salt. And then my question would be, why would Hashem have the Torah tell us this back here and not up front in the beginning when all those different minha offerings were being um, instructed? Verse fourteen. If you bring a meal offering of first fruits to Hashem, you shall bring new ears parched with fire, grits of fresh grain as your meal offering of first fruits. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, man. Oh, this is like a cookbook. Yo, grits. I wonder if you could put some cheese in those grits. Okay, so you um you bring grits of fresh grain. So whatever grain it is, the little the little kernel grit thing. It's going to be your meal offering of first fruit. Um, and which is, is that the Bikorin? I think that's called the Bikorin. First fruit. Verse 15. So you're going to add oil to it and lay frankincense on it. And it is a meal offering. So most likely you bring the grits um, and or ears of corn parched with fire or whatever it is. You bring that to the priest and they're going to do that nice combination um laying frankincense on it or whatever they do and the priest shall turn a token portion of it into smoke some of the grits and oil with all the frankincense as an offering by fire to hashem wow they have popcorn all kind of stuff happening over there <laughs> but it but it goes um it goes to smoke so we've seen the ola offering all those animals from cattle to bird. And we've seen all the minha offerings, whether you're just bringing the um, the grain, mixing with frankincense up in smoke, or you're making some type of cake or wafer or some kind of griddle pancake or grits of the grain, the, the grain itself not made into flour, but just the grain unrefined, um, whatever it is, up in smoke for the minha offering. That's what it looks like to me. If you have anything else, please let me know. Again, when you're helping us out with your comments, please put the references so we can learn from what uh, you know what you're telling us. Okay, that's the end of the third reading. Okay, let's get into that fourth reading. If your offering is a sacrifice of well-being, and that looks like this word right here, Shalamin, shalamin, a peace offering, a requital, a sacrifice for alliance or friendship, voluntary sacrifice of thanks. Um, so it's from the word shalem. I know it sounds like shalom, and if you got if you caught that, good for you. And it says shalamin offering, uh, shalamin, shalamin korbano. And that's how you say um, offering. If you if your offering is a sacrifice of well-being, so now we're in the Shalamim offering. So we had Ola, Minha. Now we're in Shalamim offering. If you offer of the herd, whether a male or a female, you shall bring before Hashem one without blemish. Look at here. So it has to be a herd animal, but this time it could be either a male or a female. Um, verse 2 of chapter 3 you shall lay a hand upon the head of your offering and slaughter it at the entrance of the tent of meeting and Aaron's sons the priest shall dash the blood against all sides of the altar and again it's not not again but it's not the person that brought it slaughtering it it's Aaron the high priest or his sons the priests are slaughtering it you're just holding your hands the smicha against it putting your weight on it um, verse three, then present from the sacrifice of well-being, the shalamin, ha shalamin, um, then present from the sacrifice of shalamin as an offering by fire to Hashem, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is about the entrails. So now the priests are going to cut open the animal and after you did your hand and it got the slaughter and the animals now dead. They're going to open it up and they're going to take the fat around the kidneys and stuff. And they're going to take that fat 
and they're going to offer that by fire to Hashem. Let's see what happens to the rest. Verse 4. Um, so all the fat that is about the entrails. Oh, look, Hashem explains it to us. The two kidneys, the fat that's on them, that is at the loins, and the protuberance that's on the liver, which you shall remove with the kidneys. Perfect explanation. Aaron's sons, verse 5, shall turn these into smoke on the altar with the burnt offering, which is upon the wood that is on the fire, as an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to Hashem. So those fat, the, those fats um, with the burnt offering, that's going to go on the wood that's on the fire as an offering of fire, of pleasing odor to Hashem. Okay, wow. This is, I just want to see something if we have a little note. Rashi, what you got? Scripture thus teaches us that the continual burnt offering should be placed on the wood pile before any other sacrifice. Let's talk about the time. Okay. All right. Verse 6. And if your offering for a sacrifice of Shalamim to Hashem is from the flock, whether male or female, you shall offer one without blemish. Now, why is it saying that? It wasn't, didn't it say it was from the flock? before if your offering is a sacrifice of well-being if you offer of the herd oh ah her is the cattle kind and the flock is like the sheep and goat kind okay uh oh uh looks like rashi is telling us it's called the shalamim offering because they bring peace peace or shalom through the world another explanation that they're called shalamim is because through them there is peace and harmony lack of envy to the altar to the priests and to the owners, since everyone receives a portion. Oh, spoiler alert. Rashi's telling us with a Shalomim offering, everybody gets some. The person that brought it, the priest, and also Hashem. Okay. Let's get back to where we were. <clears throat> Verse 6. Again, if you're offering for a sacrifice of well-being to Hashem, it's from the flock, whether male or female, you shall offer one without blemish. If you present a sheep as your offering, you shall bring it before Hashem. And lay a hand, the smicha, upon the head of your offering. It shall be slaughtered before the tent of meat, and an Aaron's son shall dash its blood against all sides of the altar. Verse 9. Then present as an offering by fire to Hashem the fat from the sacrifice of well-being, the whole broad tail which you shall remove close to the backbone, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is about the entrails. Okay, so when you get the one from the um the flock, they got some little different little fats and tail fat that these sheep and goats that um goes to Hashem. Um okay. Verse 10, the two kidneys and the fat that's on them, the that is at the loins and the protuberance on the liver, which you shall remove with the kidneys. The priest shall turn these into smoke on the altar as food, an offering by fire to Hashem. And if your offering is a goat, you shall bring it before Hashem and lay a head upon its head, a hand upon its head. It shall be slaughtered before the tent of meat, and Aaron's son shall dash its blood against all sides of the altar. Then present as your offering from it as an offering by fire to Hashem, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is about the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that's on them, that is at the loins, and the protuberance on the liver, which you shall remove with the kidneys. Verse 16, the priest will turn all these into smoke in the altar as food and offering by fire of pleasing odor. All fat is Hashem's. Verse 17, it is law or Torah for you. Um, it is law, not Torah, but it is, let me see what word do we have here. It is law for all time throughout the ages in all your settlements. settlements you must not eat any fat or any blood. Shem is really specific. Ah, it's not law. It's the, it's the, cause I said so law, the hukat, uh, hukat, hukat. Okay. All right. That's where you, you don't get the reasoning. Cause Shem just tells you this is what I want from you. Let's see if the sages were able to come up with something. Nope. <laughs> Rashi said, yeah, nah. But I'll tell you someone that tried. All right. That's the end of our fourth reading. Okay. Let's get into this fifth reading. We're in Vayikra, Perak 4, Pasuk 1, or Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1, for our fifth reading. 
Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the Israelite people thus, when a person unwittingly incurs guilt, wait, okay, let's just do a recap. <laughs> so we're in, we're in uh, chapter four now. So chapter one, we learned about the Ola and um, the Minha, I think it was chapter two. And then chapter three with the shla, shla, Shalamim offering. And now we're in chapter four, um, and we are not talking about the offerings anymore and how to do them and what animals are acceptable and what the priests will be doing in the procedure. Now we're focusing on the people. It's kind of back like how Exodus is, a shemot, um, when Moshe is speaking to the people. So let's see what's going on here. Verse two, speak to the people thus when a person unwittingly incurs guilt in regard to any of Hashem's commandments about things not to be done and does one of them without knowing it unwittingly. If it is the anointed priest who has incurred guilt, so the blame falls upon the people. <clears throat> he shall offer for the sin of which... Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, Jordan. You gotta go, bro. You gotta go right now. Um, so if the priest is the one that doesn't know, um, so that the blame falls on the people, he shall offer for the sin of which he is guilty, a bull of the herd without blemish as a sin offering for a to Hashem. So if the anointed priest has incurred the guilt, sages, help. The halachic explanation the way the um, the men of the great assembly, the rabbis, the teachers have um, determined what it means is that um, and halakha is the appropriate behavior that's required for a certain situation. The halakhic, uh, that's from Rav Kendall, uh, Mendel Kesson. The halakhic explanation is that he is liable to bring a sin offering only when there was ignorance of the real matter. Okay. Like, for instance, if there was of a law in question, it is after having considered the case. So, so say like the um, the priest is acting in the Sanhedrin or as a judge, a, a, a din, um, a dayan or something of that nature. He and he he judged incorrectly in the case. Um, so he made a mistake without knowing it in his opinion he did correctly but it turns out you know <laughs> he did not do it correctly because the the court in heaven can see what's going on but um so as a result of this error he acted against the true law just as it is stated in reference to the guilt of the whole people and this thing is hid from the eyes of the assembly that they have done um so when the high priest sins this is the guilt of the people that is, it results in the people remaining under a load of guilt. Wow. Because they are dependent on him to effect atonement for them and to pray on their behalf. And now he himself has become degenerate and, and cannot thus expiate for them. Whether they remain under, wherefore, excuse me, they remain under guilt. Wow. Thank you, Hashem. Because I was, <laughs> as I'm reading this, I'm like, wait, what? So I got confused because it says when a person unwitting, when unwittingly incurs guilt in regard to any of Hashem's commandments about things not to be done and does one of them, and then bam, it goes straight to verse three. But if it is the anointed priest who has incurred guilt, so that blame falls upon the people, I was completely lost there. But it makes sense because if he remained guil guilty, then the people remain, they bear this guilt. So, so the blame falls on the people. He's going to offer for the het, the sin. Uh, the hata, excuse me. And I'm going to just make that word come up so you can see it. So it says, he shall offer for the hata, um, of which he is guilty, a bull of the herd without blemish as a sin offering to Hashem. Verse 4, he shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of meeting before Hashem and lay hand upon the head of the bull. The bull shall be slaughtered before Hashem. And the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it into the tent of meeting. Priest shall dip his finger on the blood and sprinkle in the blood several times before Hashem in front of the curtain of the shrine, which is the Holy of Holies, I believe. Let's just make sure. 
Because last time I saw a shrine, and that's what it, had, it meant. Yeah, sprinkled before the partition veil of the Kodesh. That is, before the spot where it is exceedingly holy. Exactly in front of the space between the staves of the ark. The blood did not touch the partition veil. But it it is is if it, excuse me, but if it happened to touch it, then it touched it. It didn't invalidate the ceremony. Okay. So, um, wow. And you see that the priests kind of have to do this for the high priest. It looks like they're helping him in this. Verse 7, the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of aromatic incense, which is in the tent of meat and before Hashem, and all the rest of the bull's blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the entrance of the tent of meat. He shall remove all the fat from the bull of sin offering, the het, the hata offering, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is about the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, that is at the loins and the protuberance of the liver, which he shall remove with the kidneys. Just as it is removed from the ox of the sacrifice of well-being, the priest shall turn them into smoke on the altar of burnt offering. But, so, uh, but the hide of the bull and all its flesh, as well as its head and legs, its entrails and its dung, all the rest of the bull, he shall carry to a pure place outside the camp to the ash heap, and burn it up in a wood fire, and it shall be burned on the ash heap. So you have the fire in the Mishkan tabernacle and the fire in the pure place outside the camp. So you have two fires going. So in that fire, you get the hide, its flesh, the head and legs, its entrails, and its dung, but the fat goes to a shem. So it's like everything is burnt up except that fat that Hashem gets on the altar. Everything else goes to the other altar. And that's interesting. That's the Hata offering. So that's really different from the other, the way the other ones are done. Okay. Verse 13. And that's, um, that's for the high priest. But this category is for pe people that erred and they didn't know it. So verse 13. Now, if it is the community leadership of Israel that has erred, and the matter escapes the notice of the congregation. Because remember, leadership is leading the people, trying to make decisions and lead them in the right way. So that they do not, excuse me, so that they do any of the things which by Hashem's commandment ought not to be done. And they realize the guilt. When the sin through which they incur guilt becomes known, the congregation shall offer a bull of the herd as a sin offering and bring it before the tent of meeting. Let's just see if there's any commentary there. It's really interesting. When the sin wherein they have sinned is known, the same law, even though it is not mentioned, applies to the Kohen Hagadol, for if the sin, the high priest, for if the sin not be known to the Kohen Hagadol, then he does not bring a sin offering. Right. If he doesn't know it, then he doesn't bring one. Same with the leadership. If they don't know it, they don't bring one. It's when they find out. But other people say that the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, should bring the sacrifice every year because he may have sinned. Um, but scripture mentions when the sin is known. So Ibn Ezra, this is Ibn Ezra's commentary, excuse me, is saying that um, with regard to the whole congregation um, of Israel, for it is possible that the Kohen will inform them. However, there is no one to inform the Kohen. He informs himself. The sin offering of the congregation is the same as that of the Kohen Haggadol in all details. Thus, the Kohen Haggadol is equivalent to all of Israel. Wow, that's fire. So the Kohen Haggadol is eligible to let the leadership or whoever is leading in Israel know that they erred, but there's no one to tell the Kohen Hagadol that he erred. He has to find out through himself or some other way, Ibn Ezra is saying. So that's interesting, but because the offerings are the same and they do them the same way, pretty much, it's like it's that saying he is the same like Israel. That's amazing. Equivalent to all of Israel. Not the same. That's different. Verse 15. The elders of the community shall lay their head, hands, the smicha, upon the head of the bull before Hashem, and the bull shall be slaughtered before Hashem. The anointed priest shall bring some of the blood of the bull into the tent of meeting, and the priest shall dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle of it seven times before Hashem in the front of the curtain. Some of the blood he shall put on the horns of the altar, which is before Hashem in the tent of meeting, and the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Verse 19, he shall remove all its fat from it and turn it into smoke on the altar. 
Verse 20, he shall do with this bull just as is done with the priest's bull of sin offering. He shall do the same with it. The priest shall thus make expiation for them and they shall be forgiven. And what makes this interesting is the, the declaration of and he shall be forgiven. I just was wondering if there was something um, uh, which speaks on hmm, the idea that whatever they're they're unknowingly unwittingly uh done they unwittingly hata is going to be forgiven verse 21 he shall carry the bull outside the camp and burn it as he burned the first bull it is the sin offering of the congregation wow verse 22 so you see how um it said it started out the leadership of israel but then when you see when you look into more it's it's israel like, it's just like saying any person of it's it's Israel collectively. So it's kind of cool. Verse twenty two. In case it is a chieftain who incurs guilt, like a local magistrate or something, by doing unwittingly unwittingly any of these things, which by the commandment of his God Hashem ought not to be done, and he realizes his guilt or the sin of which he is guilty is made known, he shall bring as his offering a male goat without blemish. So now we're getting into local munis municipality or your local uh, leadership. He, when he finds out that he did something unknowingly, again, maybe he gave somebody a ticket for their donkey speeding and whatever. And um, he finds out that uh, he did wrong. He's going to bring a male goat, not the bull, but a male goat. He shall lay, I, I'm just curious um, if that, because it's interesting that the high priest and the 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 um, Israel's leadership are the same, but now we get to the lower municipalities, the lower governments, and it's um, different. But I don't see anything here. <clears throat> uh, he shall bring as an offering a male goat without blemish. blemish verse twenty four. He shall lay a hand upon the goat's head and it shall be slaughtered and at the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered before Hashem. It's a sin offering. Hata. Hata. Yep. The priest shall take with his finger some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. Verse 26. And all of its fat he shall turn into smoke on the altar like the fat of the sacrifice of well-being of the Shalamim. The priest shall thus make expiation on his behalf for his sin, and he shall be forgiven. And that's the end of our fifth reading. Okay, let's do our sixth reading, chapter 4. By the cry, chapter 4, verse 27. If any person from among the populace unwittingly incurs guilt by doing any of the things which, ha uh, which by Hashem's commandments ought not to be done and realizes the guilt, so we went Kohen Haggadol, high priest. Then we went leadership. Then we went local leadership now we're to the individual or the sin of which one is guilty is made known that the person shall bring a female goat without blemish as an offering for the sin of the of which that one is guilty Oops, excuse me yeah there we go verse 30 uh no verse 29 the offerer shall lay a hand upon the head of the sin offering the sin offering shall be slaughtered at the place of the burnt offering Verse 30, the priest shall take with his finger some of its blood and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. The offerer shall remove all of its fat just as the fat is removed from the sacrifice of well-being and the priest shall turn it into smoke on the altar for a pleasing odor to Hashem. The priest shall thus make expiation for that person who shall be forgiven. Baruch Hashem. If the offering one brings as a sin offering is a sheep, that person shall bring a female without blemish. Okay, so the actual populace has a choice if they're going to bring a sheep, a male, excuse me, a female sheep or a female goat. So if the offerer shall lay a hand upon the head of the sin offering and it shall be slaughtered as a sin offering at the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered. Verse 34, the priest shall take with his finger some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. And all its fat the offerer shall remove, just as the fat of the sheep or the sacrifice of well-being is removed. And this the priest shall turn into smoke on the altar over Hashem's offering by fire. For the sin of which one is guilty, the priest shall thus make 
expiation on behalf of that person who shall be forgiven. Let's continue in verse 5, chapter 1. If a person incurs guilt when one has heard a public imprecation, but although able to testify as having either seen or learned of the matter, and has not given information, and thus is subject to punishment. Okay, we so we just went from... Um, now, we really have to pay attention in Western thought. So the sin that we just learned about in the beginning of, uh, or in chapter 4, is a sin that you are unaware of. You didn't know you did it. All right? Uh, starting with leadership all the way down to the individual. Now we're talking about someone who heard something and is able to testify on the behalf of somebody else um, and chooses not to testify on behalf of that person with the information that you have that can help that person. It's not even a false witness. It's the opposite of a false witness. It's a witness who is not doing right because they're not being a witness as they should. Um, That person is subject to punishment. Or when a person, verse 2, touches any impure thing, and Hashem's going to list out what that means, be it a carcass of an impure beast like a pig or a camel, or the carcass of an impure cattle, or the carcass of an impure creeping thing, and the fact has escaped notice, and then being impure, the person realizes guilt. Okay, so first one is a, a witness who does not testify. The second is a person who touches something impure, and... um they didn't notice it, but then they realized their guilt somehow. Um, or here's another category: or when one touches, in, uh, excuse me, or when one touches human impurity, such as any such a impurity whereby someone becomes impure, and though having known about it, the fact has escaped notice, but later that person realizes the guilt. So they knew it, but somehow it didn't get noticed. Here's another one. Or when a person utters an oath to bad or good purpose, I swear, like anything like that, whatever a human being may utter an oath, and though having known about it, the fact has escaped notice, but later that person realizes the guilt in any of these matters. Upon realizing guilt of any of these matters, one shall confess having sinned in that way. This is where you see confession. So it's either for a person that should have been a witness and did not, someone that touched something they shouldn't have touched, um, someone that touched uh, like a, a carcass of an impure animal, someone that touched some type of human impurity, and we know um, maybe is it menstrual or I don't know, maybe it's a semen, I'm not sure. I, I'm just trying to think of what's impurity. Um, or when a person makes an oath, whether for a good purpose or a bad, um, and it escaped notice. And so for these four things, this is when they realize that they did wrong. They have to confess this sin first. And then one shall bring as a penalty to Hashem for the sin of which one is guilty, a female from the flock, a sheep or goat as a sin offering. And the priest shall make expiation for the sin on that person's behalf. So it's really important because in Western thought, we use this word sin, 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 sin all the time. And you see there's specific sins um, that get offerings. And you and you see here, half the time it's they maybe they did something and it just didn't dawn on them that they did it. It's not like intentional sin where you're literally going out to harm somebody. I had to stop the beep. Sorry. Um, but if... So you see that they have to bring this bring this offering, this penalty, a female from the plot, a flock. Um, expiation is made. But if one's means do not suffice. So if you're poor and you can't afford that sheep or goat, um, that person shall bring to Hashem as penalty for that of which one is guilty. You're going to bring two turtle doves or two pigeons one for each, excuse me, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, which is interesting. So you have a regular hata offering and the other for a ola offering. So we have, oh, so, okay. So we have, we, we started off with the ola offering, the 
animal that goes up in smoke. Then we had the minha offering, which was like that meal, the flour with the oil and the frankincense. And then we had the shlamim offering, which was a peaceful offering. And then we have, um, and now we see the hata offering to sin, for sin. So when you bring the sheep or the goat, I guess that just suffices for everything. But when you bring birds, you have to have two of them. One for the hata offering and one from the ola offering. Verse 8, the offerer shall bring them to the priest who shall offer first the bird for the sin offering, pinching its head at the nape without severing it. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on the sin offering on the side of the altar. And what remains of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. A hata. The second bird he shall prepare as a burnt offering according to regulation. For the sin of which one is guilty, the priest shall thus make expiation on behalf of that bird who shall be forgiven. Interesting. So the first bird is the... Let's see. The first bird is the hata. And the second bird is the ola offering. Yeah. So that's the one. So the first, you first you're going to take care of the sin with the sin offering. And then the second bird is for the burnt offering to Hisham. That's the end of our sixth reading. Okay, let's do our seventh reading. Verse 11 of chapter 5. And if one man, excuse me, and if one means... Once, <laughs> and if one's means do not suffice for two turtle doves or two pigeons, that person shall bring as an offering for that of which one is guilty a tenth of an ephah of choice flour for a sin offering. One shall not add oil to it or lay frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. Just bear. The offerer shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall scoop out a handful of the token. A handful as a token portion and turn it into smoke on the altar with Hashem's offerings by fire. It is a hata offering. For whichever of these sins one is guilty, the priest shall thus make expiation on behalf of that person who shall be forgiven. It belongs to the priest like the meal offering. Oh, wow. So it's like the minha offering. Portion goes to Hashem and the rest goes to the priest. And okay, so that's the so if you can't offer the sheep or goat, female sheep or goat, then you can do the bird. If you can't do the bird, you can do this. But you can only do you can only offer the the meal offering if you have one of those sins now that you didn't didn't cross your mind that you were sinning. And that was Hashem made that real clear. Okay. Interesting. Uh verse 14 and Hashem spoke to Moshe saying when a person commits a trespass being unwittingly remiss about any of Hashem's sacred things one shall bring as a penalty to Hashem a ram without blemish from the flock convertible into payment in silver by sanctuary weight as a guilt offering okay let's see I don't really understand what, what's going on there the term ma'al from above I think in the scripture denotes changing and they committed mal against God of their fathers. Yeah, but what does this mean? When a person commits a trespass, being unwittingly remiss, that one has derived some benefit from and made use of a holy thing. Where this is prohibited. The scripture should describe it here as sin. Oh, so if a person commit a, a mal from above, <laughs> whereby it would be sinning, though... But if you should argue that the anal analogy make, hmm. Uh, scripture imposes the prohibition only upon those who eat. I, okay. So it sounds like it's when you took something that belongs to Hashem and you used it for a benefit for yourself. Say maybe the flesh forks or whatever that's used for flaying the meat. Maybe one of the priests... Uh, when they when they took some of the meat for the shalom, shalom, shalomim offering, they didn't have a knife or a fork or something, and they went and got the holy one, <laughs> and they used that to eat. Uh, they they have to they've committed a trespass. I, that's what it looks like. And on this one, you got to bring a um, you got to bring a ram. And it looks like the trespass is called. So when you trespass, it's the ma'al ma'al. 
Um, it just looks like it says from above, and if I translate it directly. Um, I'm just trying to see what it's called. No, it's a regular hata. Okay, I'm missing something. I was trying to see if it had a uh, type of name. Okay. So anyway, you're going to bring this ram from your flock. You can turn, you're going to turn it into a payment by weight of silver. So this person shall make restitution for the remission record regarding the sacred things, adding a fifth part of it and giving it to the priest. So this is a money type of transaction. When you commit this kind of trespass or sin, you're going to take whatever the cost was. So if that they weighed a ram and it's worth, I don't know, um, a hundred, uh, sh shekels of silver, however it works. You're going to have to pay that plus an additional fifth or 20%. So you're going to have to pay 120 shekels. Um, and you give it to the priest. The priest shall make expiation with the ram of the guilt offering on behalf of that person who shall be forgiven. Verse 17. And a person who, without knowing it, sins in regard to any of Hashem's commandments about, about things not to be done and then realizes guilt, such a person shall be subject to punishment. Um, I'm just interested in here, like, is it, is this, nope, not that, there we go, commentary. Speaking of a person whom there has occurred, uh, Karat Sefek, that is speaking of a person who is doubtful whether he has inadvertently committed an act of such a character as to be punishable, punishable with Karat, if done willingly. A Karat, it means when you get cut off from the people, I believe. Um, excommunicated but in a death kind of way I think okay um, so I'm not sure what it is but any, it's again a person who is sinning without knowing it and he's sinning in regards to any of Hashem's commandments um, that he realizes the guilt and it looks like it's it looks like it's a sin that doesn't it doesn't fall under the other ones that was listed because I cannot see Let's continue reading. Maybe it explains it more, but I don't see anything. Verse 18. So that person shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish from the flock or the equivalent as a guilt offering. For the error committing unwittingly, well, unwittingly, the priest shall make expiation on behalf of that person who is forgiven. It is a guilt offering. Here we go. So that's called an asham offering. It It's... um. But they didn't know they did it. So, yeah, so that's the Asham offering. Um, it is a guilt offer, offering guilt. Guilt has been incurred before Hashem spoke to me. Guilt has been incurred before Hashem. Okay, Asham. Verse 20, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, when a person sins and commits a trespass against Hashem by dealing deceitfully with another in the matter of a deposit or a pledge or through robbery or by defrauding another. Okay, so verse 19 ends all the ones where you did something. You just weren't sure that you did it or you didn't know you did it or something. It's unwittingly. That's what the they all share. These guilt, everyone, you just you didn't know you did it. Now, verse 21, or verse 20, people know what's going on. Verse 21, when a person sins and commits a trespass against Hashem by dealing deceitfully with another in a matter of a deposit or a pledge or through robbery or by defrauding another or by finding something lost and lying about it, if one swears falsely regarding any one of the various things that someone may do and sin thereby, when one has thus sinned and realizing guilt, would restore either that which was gotten through robbery or fraud or the entrusted deposit or the lost thing that was found or anything else about which once were falsely, that person shall repay the principal amount and add a fifth part to it. One shall pay it to its owner upon realizing the guilt. Okay, so that's pretty clear. So when it comes to robbery, defrauding someone, stealing their deposit money, you know, landlords do it all the time with their deposit <laughs> money. Uh, they say you damaged their apartment. You got these beautiful pictures of an apartment undamaged, but they take your stuff. Um, 
you don't uh, kill an animal. There's no there's no uh, sin sacrifice that way. You pay by restitution and you give them an extra 20%. Okay, Western thought. Let's make sure we got that understood. Verse 25, that person shall bring to the priest as a penalty to Hashem, a ram without blemish from the flock or the equivalent as a guilt offering. And the priest shall make expiation before Hashem on behalf of that person who shall be forgiven for whatever was done to draw blame thereby. Oh, excuse me. I'm as wrong as two left shoes. So we do, you, you got to pay it back and you get the ram. You got to do the ram without blemish. So um, now that goes, okay, so that's really interesting. So it's a two-way street. So you are, and I, again, I apologize for my error. You are rested, you're paying restitution to your brother, your fellow brother with restoring the money plus the 20%. Then you, once you get that cleared out, then you do your restitution to Hashem with the ram. So it does, that does take uh, a sacrifice. But these are for robbery, dealing deceit, a, a deceitful dealing in the matter of money, some kind of money, like deposit, pledge, robbery, or defrauding. So these are all monetary issues that you pay the person back and then you do the ram. Okay. Nothing to do with just regular, it's monetary. Okay. Uh, wow, that's the end of our reading. So next week, you see there, it's a tzav. All right, so let's get ready to go for our um, haftarah portion. That was a fun lesson. <laughs> it was fun. I like that lesson. I like that Torah portion. I like them all. But I like that one. Okay. Let's do our haftarah portion, which is Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21 through Isaiah chapter 44, verse 23. Those are interesting numbers. They're like the same. Okay. All right. I'm excited now because that lesson was so great. The people I formed for myself that they might declare my praise, but you have not worshipped me, O Jacob, that you should not be weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, not, nor wearied you about frankincense. You have not brought me fragrant reed with money, nor sated me with the fat of your sacrifices. Instead, you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. It is I, I who for my own sake wipe your transgressions away. And remember your sins no more. Wow, for my own sake, Hashem. Help me remember. Let us join an argument. Tell your vision that you may be vindicated. Verse 27. Your earliest ancestor sinned, and you, your spokesman transgressed against me. So I profaned the holy princes. I abandoned Jacob to uh, prescription and Israel to mockery. Uh, chapter uh, 44, verse 1, Isaiah. Here, but here now, O Jacob, my servant Israel, who I have chosen. Thus said God, your maker, your creator, who has helped you since birth. Fear not, my servant Jacob, Jeshurun, who I have chosen. Even as I pour water on thirsty soil and rain upon dry ground, so will I pour my spirit on your offspring, my blessing upon your pos posterity. And they shall sprout like grass, like willows by water courses. One shall say, I am God's, and another shall use the name of Jacob. Another shall mark his arm of God and adopt the name of Israel. Thus said God, the sovereign of Israel, their redeemer, God of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And there is no God but me. Amen to that. Who like me can announce, can foretell it and match me thereby? Even as I told the future to an ancient people, so let anyone foretell coming events to them. Do not be frightened. Do not be shaken. Have I not from of old predicted to you? I foretold and you are my witnesses. Is there any God then but me? There is no other rock. I know none. The makers of idols are all work to no purpose. And the things they treasure can do no good, as they themselves can testify. They ne neither look nor think, and so they shall be shamed. Oops, excuse me. Who would fashion a god or cast a statue that can do no good? Lo, 
All the adherents shall be shamed. They are craftsmen. Are mere, they are craftsmen. Are merely human. Let them assemble and stand up. <clears throat> they shall be cowed and they shall be shamed. The craftsman in iron with his tools works it over charcoal and fashions it by hammering, working with the strength of his arm. Should he go hungry, his strength would ebb. Should he drink no water, he would grow faint. The craftsman in wood measures a line and marks out the shape with a stylus. He forms it with scraping tools, marking it out with a compass. He gives it the form of a person, human beauty to dwell in a shrine. For his use, he cuts down cedars. He chooses plain trees and oaks. He sets aside trees of the forest or plants firs and the rain makes them grow. All, these, all this serves a mortal for fuel. He takes some to warm himself and he built the same wood that he used to make the idol he's using to warm himself. Uh, and he builds a fire and bakes bread. The holy wood, quote unquote. He also makes a god of it and worships it, fashions an idol and bows down to it. Part of it he burns in a fire. On that part he roasts meat and he eats the roast and is sated. He also warms himself and cries, ah, I'm warm. I can feel the heat. Of the rest he makes a god, his own carving. He bows down to it, worships it. He prays to it and cries, save me for you are my god. They have, will have, they have no wit or judgment. Their eyes are besmeared and they see not. Their minds, they cannot think. They do not give thought. They lack the wit and judgment to say, part of it I burned in the fire. Wait, and I also baked some bread on the coals. I roasted some meat and ate it. Should I make the rest an abhorrence? Should I bow to a block of wood? He pursues ashes. A deluded mind has led him astray and he cannot save himself. He never says to himself, the thing in my hand is a fraud. Remember these things, O Jacob, for you, O Israel, are my servant. I fashioned you. You are my servant. O Israel, never forget me. I wipe away your sins like a cloud, your transgression like mist. Come back to me, for I redeem you. Shout, O heavens, for God has acted. <clears throat> Shout aloud, O depths of the earth. Shout for joy, O mountains, O forests with your trees. For God has redeemed Jacob, has gained glory through Israel. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Glory through Israel. Thank you, Israel. Mm. And thank you, Israel and the sages, for giving us the commentary and the understanding and matching these together. It makes so much sense. We learned about the different types of offerings, what they're for, and the things, um, you know, how to make restitution. And then we see in Isaiah, these things uh, were left awry. They, they weren't done. And Hashem is like, you know, I told you how to do things for my sake. So that I can be with you, basically, and you're not doing those things. Oh, that was an amazing match. Thank you so much for studying with me. Um, please, any insight that you have, put them in the comments so we can all learn and grow. And um, and uh, let's do this again next week. Um, have a Shabbat Shalom and a Shavuot Tov, and see you next time. Thanks.